Crypto Thermies Podcast, X Libras Edition. Welcome to books and events from the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to the second edition of the Thos Hermes podcast Ex Libris episodes. As many of you probably already know, Ex Libris are episodes not centered around the long interview, but they serve to present to you events, music, films, and most importantly, books with subjects from the world of the Western esoteric tradition. My name is Rudolf and I am your host. And this episode is the August Ex Libris edition coming to you on August 25, 2019. Our first Ex Libris episode has met a very nice echo from all of you and a lot of downloads. So thank you for that. Many of you also liked that I have now introduced chapter markers on the podcast, meaning that if your podcast player can retrieve and work with chapters, you can jump directly to the beginning of the different chapters of this podcast. By the way, since last week, also the regular Thoughts Hermes episodes have those chapter marks. I would like to thank those of you who already have become patrons on Patreon or who have made a donation. This is really very much appreciated. It does not make any earning for me. It is just meant to cover my production cost and further investments to improve and maintain the quality of this podcast. So, if you have not yet done so, please hop over to Patreon. Look for the Thoughts Hermes page and become a patron. You can find direct links, of course, also on the Thoughts Hermes homepage, www.thothermes.com. That is thothermes.com, thoughtshermes.com. There you will find also a PayPal donation button if you prefer to do a one-off donation. And don't forget to leave me feedback or suggestions on the website or also on Twitter or Facebook. This will help to keep this podcast lively and stay improving. And here comes a message about our sponsor. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality Occult Books and Contemporary Esoterica Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a triune relationship between publisher, author and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian philosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com Now, let me tell you what you will get on today's episode. In Chapter 1, I would like to introduce to you a book by Masonic and Hermetic scholar Martin Folks from the United Kingdom. He has written a small but very important book called A Mosaic Palace, Freemasonry and the Art of Memory, released late in 2018. We are going to hear all about it in Chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the place where my friend Greg Kaminsky presents a book of his choice, 
Therefore, this chapter is very appropriately named Greg's Choice. This month, Greg reviews and talks about a new book by the name of The Art and Science of Initiation, where a number of highly knowledgeable scholars present their view on this subject. For chapter 3, I have invited another friend of mine to talk about the book which I think needs to be presented here. Ursula Czerny is Austrian like myself from the lovely city of Salzburg and she has not only read The Brazen Vessel, the latest book out of the wonderful house of Scarlet Imprint, but she also made rather impressive personal experiences with it, which she shares in a talk with me in Chapter 3. Some of you might remember that in early June I had posted on Facebook, Twitter and the website a request if someone would like to do a guest report on the wonderful conference of the European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism, also called ESWE. And very quickly somebody turned up to say yes, and not just anyone. Chris Chudice, academic and university teacher in Gothenburg, author and specialist on the subject of the Western esotericism, he contacted me and last week we recorded a 20-minute talk about his impressions from the conference. And this will be our chapter four. Thanks, Chris. It was great you did that. We could have talked much longer about that conference. There was so much content in it. Unbelievable. So this is our program for episode two. Very mixed again. And I hope everyone will find something for them. Of course, on our website, you will find all the necessary information about the books and authors we discussed today, including links to websites, where to buy the books, etc. So go to www.thoshermes.com for more on that. Also, and I want to point it out, there is a link to a PDF download of the full program and all the abstracts of the over 120 papers and talks given at the S3 conference. Very interesting indeed. So please go to the website, don't miss that. Now, before we delve right into chapter one, I owe you a piece of music, don't I? Okay, here it comes. And today it's a very special one, at least to me, and I hope you'll like it too. Do you remember the Australian rock band INXS? which from the late 70s to the early 90s were a big player? Well, many of you might be too young to remember, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy what you hear. Here comes INXS with their wonderful song, Mystify. Oh, there's a mystic.
Chapter 1 I don't know if it is just me who is seeing this or if it is a real trend. But it seems to me that only recently the Masonic art of memory has been kind of rediscovered not only by brethren but also by writers and authors. And it is suddenly again something that quite a few people have started to talk about. In fact, it is a very old tradition that we talk about here, much older than Freemasonry. It was Dame Frances Yates, the great English author who, with her book The Art of Memory in 1966, was one of the first to talk about it in an academic way in our lifetime. Martin Fawkes, who has written this little book, A Mosaic Palace, published by Lewis Masonic in 2018, is certainly not unknown to those of you who follow hermetic studies on the internet. Martin is a meditation expert at a very high level, especially also in the less often heard of hermetic meditation. He is a martial artist and yoga teacher, and of course, he is an author and a Freemason of many years. But to make it very clear from the beginning, you don't have to know anything about Freemasonry to understand and enjoy the book and its subject. Martin explains those few details that might be helpful to know very clearly. And this makes the book accessible for anyone interested. Maybe I should briefly try to explain what Masonry and the art of memory in that context mean. In fact, as Martin explains, memory is very important in Freemasonry. Memorizing the lengthy rituals, ritual teaching and testing, learning symbols and precise positioning of objects, all that demands a good memory effort from each brother. Also, eloquence and rhetoric make use of good memory. In fact, the cultivation of virtue and therefore also of memory and its usage, is one of the central aims of classical Freemasonry, especially in its Anglo-Saxon form. I don't want to give more detail here, but you will be able to find all of that in the book. Martin Fox shows us in his paper the origins and development of the kind of art of memory that Freemasonry has adopted, and he does that very clearly. And this is the main part and the very interesting part of this work. Martin starts back in the classical times with ancient Roman orator Cicero's book on oratory and also with an initial legend where it all started. Then he follows the development right into the Christian tradition of memory, giving St. Augustine as its first example follows the very important medieval tradition of memorizing methods and all of this culminates in the hermetic art of memory where Giulio Camillo's theater of memory in 1511 stood at its beginning. I certainly don't have to introduce Giordano Bruno to you 
but I believe that many of you have not heard of his book Ars Memoriae, The Art of Memory, have you? And also John Dees, for example, works is full of references to this art. Falk's book has the merit to pass through all of these periods in a very concise and interesting way. His booklet does not pretend to give the whole story, which would in fact be impossible. But it tells us enough about the history of the art of memory to make us curious and to want to continue to research and find out more about this art. And also in the final part, where we then get the detailed explanation why and how Freemasonry has adopted this art, Martin leaves enough room that we would not like to leave it there, but maybe would even want to learn this art ourselves. At this point, you might ask, well, what is the art of memory like? What miracle method is being used here? In order to explain that a bit and at the same time also make you want to maybe learn it for yourself, I'm going to read you a page from Martin Falk's book just to give you the idea. The method of the art of memory is summarized. The first step in the art of memory is to create a memory palace. This is an imaginary backdrop to be used for future memory work. Once the memory palace has been created in the practitioner's mind, they are then able to revisit whenever they wish, to place whatever it is they wish to remember there. Thus, the practitioner should then be able to return to the memory palace to recall things with ease. Now, how to make a memory palace? 1. Choose a building or location which is exciting, inspiring and small enough to easily remember. Some good examples of this would be a house, a room with many columns, a recess, an arch or even a picture can be used. 2. Visualize walking around this place in the imagination, stopping at specific locations in turn. Each stop in this imaginary tour should have something of interest in it. A good example would be a statue, a mark, a portrait or object that holds a strong like or dislike. The position for each station or location should be very different and well spaced out about 30 feet apart is ideal. A number or letter can also be associated with each place. 3. Practice walking the memory palace repeatedly using the imagination to its full potential, ensuring all the senses are engaged until the palace can be walked through with ease, always keeping to the same route and stopping at the same places of interest. Consider this newly formed palace as a wax tablet or notebook ready to be used to record anything that needs to be remembered. This practice can also be elaborated if needed by forming different themed memory palaces to store information on specific subjects. However, it is important to make sure that each palace is distinct and very different from one another. End of citation. Well, after that, you will need to add images in the freshly created palaces, rooms and place them in locations in the palace. They should be strongly emotional and easy to recall. And finally, you attach words, objects, lists or whatever you need to remember and attach them to the images you place in the palace. Sounds complicated? Well, at first it might, but maybe it sounds even a bit less complicated to those of you who also practice meditation or who certainly practice imagination in some magical experiences. Once you get trained in it, it actually works very well. Try it out. Get Martin Falk's book and start from there. Reading alone will not be the thing. You will have to do your homework and not a little portion of it, believe me. As you can probably tell, I find this subject really fascinating. 
you might remember that I'm planning to do from time to time some roundtables, inviting three or four guests at the same time to talk about a certain subject. And the art of memory, Masonic, but also hermetic and occult in general, is going to be among the first of those subjects we are going to do roundtables about. A Mosaic Palace, Freemasonry and the Art of Memory. This book by Martin Fox in his only 40 pages or so is a powerhouse full of information, nicely balanced between its hermetic claim but leaving masonry where it belongs. A nice mix of pragmatic theory and exciting practice. A perfect introduction into the matter that depending on your interests will either make you want to read on in other words that Fox mentions or even better, I think, want to start practicing the art of memory yourself, be you a Freemason or not. A short last note. Martin Fox will be the guest in one of our upcoming shows later in this season, but there we will talk about his expertise on the hermetic arts in general and meditation in particular. So do buy the book and come back to Thoth Hermes for more with Martin Fox. Chapter 2 Greg's Choice Hello, this is Greg Kaminsky of the Cult of Personality podcast and ChamberofReflection.com. Thank you for joining me for Greg's Choice. And today I'm going to discuss a very recent book from Lewis Masonic entitled The Art and Science of Initiation, which was compiled and edited by Jedediah French and Angel Millar. Uh, just as last month, I must confess prior to beginning the review that uh, this will not and cannot be an objective review of the book because I am one of the contributing authors having submitted an essay or article on the subject of the Mysteries of Initiation in Ancient Greece at Samothrace. Now, I really, really like this book a lot, and I think it's very timely. In fact, it, it might be overdue, but I think Jedediah French and Angel Millar have done great work in putting this together, along with all of the contributors, which includes uh, Angel Millar himself, Richard Smoley, Susanna Ackerman, Adam Kendall, myself, Timothy Scott, Jocelyn Godwin, Jeffrey S. Kupperman, C.R. Dunning Jr., Herbie Brennan, Mark Booth, Richard Kaczynski, and Donald Tyson. Now, that is quite a lineup of authors, even if you exclude me. Uh, you know, these, these authors are what I would consider pretty heavy hitters. And I'm honored to be among them and included in the book. Now, I think it's really interesting, the design and the intention behind the book, It's not academic, and yet it's not strictly speculative and based on experience either. It's a bit of a mix. 
And I think that the way that they did this is really, really useful because it, it brings these two sorts of approaches, you know, the scholarly approach and the experiential approach or speculative approach, um, which is going to be more emotional and less intellectual. These are both important. And to put these together, well, only then can you have a complete picture. Um, and now I want to quote from the introduction that was written by Jedediah French, because I think his words are really important and form the foundation of, of what he's trying to present here. Now, he says, in the secluded world of Masonic literature and opinion, a fissure is apparent between those who value experiential, romantic, esoteric wisdom teachings and those who privilege a strictly academic and heavily intellectual form of scholarship, drawing on historical research and forensic evidence. We all know brethren on either side of this divide, all with valid reasons for upholding their respective positions. It is therefore our intention to bring both interpretations of masonry together in one volume and place them into conversation. There is something gainful in this attempt, not the least of which is a broader and more complete picture of the project's subject matter, ritual initiation. He then goes on to express the idea that one of the other gaps that they're trying to bridge is a political one. Now, we all know uh, in the world today, um, people are quite divided in regards to their political opinions. Yet, it's important to understand and realize that in terms of spiritual development and contemplation, we must aim to remove separation, you know, whether that's from our fellow man or from the world itself, which we are divided from because of our own ideas and concepts about it. So another uh, interesting aspect of this book is that it explores the ideas of traditionalism, which is a philosophical and spiritual movement. Um, and there exists in some ways a tension between what you could call a traditionalist school and the institution of Freemasonry. So, Looking at things from a traditionalist perspective is important because it calls into question our esoteric practice, our ideas about modernity and progress, and how we can become better, how we transform ourselves, and are those processes subject to what we think of as progress or not? This is a great question. And I think I would like to quote Jedediah again in the end of his introduction because he, he really sets the tone for the book when he writes, Why create such a book? Because the world is in crisis. We feel it is the duty of Masons to assist as custodians of the societies they helped usher in through the Industrial Revolution. The duty of a Mason and the oaths he takes are no small thing. They are of the utmost importance and seriousness. The initiations the Mason undergoes should not be squandered, but rather produce real transformational change down to the roots of the soul. For this reason, it is imperative that we learn to understand, harness, and enhance the Masonic initiatory rituals to their fullest capacity. 
Only this will bring about the type of change in being that we will need to be successful in moving forward. The greatest possible folly would be for our comprehension of these initiatory practices to decline more than it already has. It is therefore our contention that Masons should not become better men, but the best. The duty of every true Mason must be to view the entire world, regardless of race, skin tone, sex, class, or creed, as one human family, as one interconnected lodge. When economists today speak of the fourth industrial revolution, to our mind, this is where Mason should be especially active as the workforce and foundational infrastructure of our societies yield to advanced technologies and robotics. Masons must make sure this new industry does not lose sight of the spiritual implications of this massive change and help guide these technologies toward the spiritual well-being and betterment of everyone on the planet. As the operative Masons who built the cathedral strove to fashion base matter into spiritual harmony for the good of the souls of local people, so should modern Masons strive for the same in advanced technology, turning the scientific and engineering laboratories again into sacred spaces and altars dedicated to the spiritual upliftment of all. Well, that is a great and noble intention in my mind. Now, again, I, I, there's too much material in this book for me to really commentate, comment on all of it. Um, but I, I'd like to leave you with a, a little taste of my own article in the book about the initiations of Samothrace in ancient Greece. I think it's important to understand the way that a location and a mythology and a ritual are all put together in a way that has a very transformative effect on a human being. Now, this is still accomplished today using very similar formula and it is incumbent upon us to research this, to recognize it, to understand it in order that when we go through initiations or we perform them, that we are including every significant and potentially transformative element just as if this was an alchemical laboratory, you know, an alchemical flask where we're taking the ingredients and all putting them in, in order that these catalysts will affect a change on the substance in the flask, which, which is ultimately us. I really cannot stress enough that the way the initiation functions, all of the ingredients that go into it are so important and in many ways can determine how effective the potential outcome may be. And I think, again, this is a book that if, if one is interested in the esoteric, whether you're a Freemason or not, uh, this is a book you should read. Again, it's available from Lewis Masonic, The Art and Science of Initiation. I'm so excited that it's come out, and I'm really thrilled with the level of scholarship, research, writing, the way it's all expressed, all for the highest purpose, there is something in this book for just about everyone. If you are interested in these subjects, I don't think I could recommend this book highly enough. Jedediah French and Angel Millar have really done a tremendous job, and I commend Lewis Masonic for supporting their vision 
and bringing this forward so that we all may benefit. Chapter 3. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Ursula here today. Ursula Tierney from Salzburg, not, uh, not far away from where I am. Hello, Ursula. Hello. And you, uh, it's a pleasure for us that you will talk to us about a book on Ex Libris, a book that has been quite talked about in the occult circles of the last few months, also because it's been uh, an issue by Scarlet Imprint and by their, by their uh, makers, so to speak, Peter Gray and Alkistis. And it's called The Brazen Vessel. And you have read it for us and you're going to tell us uh, about that book, uh, what was special for you, what you thought about it. Well, I'll leave you to stage. The Brazen Vessel, let's go. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure for me, actually. I think I'll just start by saying that um, Peter and Alcestis have done, again, an incredibly beautiful work. Um, because the texture of the materials is exceptional, as always, and it's beyond discussion. So it's all, only from the outside. You touch it, you feel it. It's even more special because what's hidden in the inside is um, basically an alchemical mix of presentations and essays of the last 10 years, um, starting in 2008 and ending in 2018. All these um, topics and essays revolve basically around their work with the Red Goddess, as they experienced it around witchcraft in general and um, around encountering divinity in very different forms, by trance work, by dancing, etc. Some of these texts are of a highly personal nature. I, I'd go as far to call them rather private, like excerpts from diaries, for example, and experiences um, about having some ritual work done. The main point is that um, they write about experiencing contact in very different forms. Let, let's put it this way. This is one part of, of the book, one main part. Mm -hmm. The other main part of the book are meticulously researched and brilliantly written essays um, about historical, philosophical and magical events, which they tie together by strings which might not be seen at the very first sight, but they are there. So even more, you can find beautiful, haunting black and white photographs um, of dance rituals and performances and sacred sites. This is um, something unique because I've never had a book in my hands that contains such personal pictures. It goes mm -hmm. very well with the contents. Especially, what struck me especially deeply is that Archistis goes very far in, into detail about her dancing and movement work and its relevance for her magical workings. And this is also something highly personal and transformative for me personally. I think they've done a beautiful job. That sounds all great. Yes, you're right. I mean, those books, they always look also so special. I mean, I've had several of them in my hands uh, and even the experience of the book as a book, even before you open it and when you open it, is, I think, for them also part of what they intend and what they want people to have as a holistic experience. Don't you think so? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think this book radiates something. Um, it had quite an impact on me personally. Maybe I'll get to that one <laughs> a mm -hmm. bit later. Um, what is quite clear is that their engagement with the Red Goddess in, um, is very unique and very authentic. And it comes across exactly like that. So the workings um, include 
devotional work, performances, rituals, and it's it's like all these things make or are, are condensed into this book, which you can actually touch. So it's like some fabric they weave, and you can actually touch it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's it's incredible. It's really incredible work. Do you have maybe an example or for for one of the essays you want to talk about? Actually, the last the last one is I don't know if they see if if they have a hierarchy of of um, the relevance of all these essays. I think all of them are relevant, but the last one is is something special. Um, it's actually titled "My Time Is Come," and it's from. 2018 joint presentation at the Cultural Conference in Berlin. And um, in this essay, they basically they take us on a journey um, exploring different concepts of time. Mm-hmm. That's the first introduction. So then um, it's very densely written. The first part focuses on um, these angelical workings and the way they were entwined with his concepts about time and um, the political aims of the British Empire back then and also his apocalyptic thoughts. So it's quite an interesting material um, it's presented there. And then they go on um, talking about Crawley, of course, and his approach after inheriting these material and working with that through the lens of the Golden Dawn. Um, Kroll is op- also openly criticized for being misogynistic, and um, that's something I can relate to personally, mm-hmm. um, although I respect his work. But um, Peter and Archistus present ultimately Jack Parsons' work with his Libro 49, and consider him, and I quote this one, as one of the fathers of modern witchcraft, as a practice for spiritual, sexual, and political renewal. Mm-hmm. And this is something that rings a bell with me and touches me deeply because I can really agree with that. And um, whatever his fate was, he he was for me definitely one of the um, one of the magicians I I really regard one of the greatest as one of the greatest. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is the first part of this last essay. The second part is again highly personal. It's split up into four parts, four subparts, called um, titled Incarnation, Presence, Coming, and Love. And it is basically about um, the personal engagement with the Red Goddess by means of dance and performance. And by means of dance and performance, they basically all the time and this all the time experience um, like time disappears time goes different ways during performance during ritual many of us notice things shift and this shifting experience through the body through the movements of the body which every one of us can also call its vessel basically this um, experience opens up a space and an occulted time to meet divinity. This is what they are writing about, their personal experiences with that. And for me personally, I can just validate this because I had some very strange experiences um, during the time I read this book. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, encountering divinity is probably pretty high on our to-do lists anyway. It certainly should be, and indeed, yeah. Yeah. Your approach uh, seems to be quite similar to what I think. Um, what I always like in their books, uh, Peter and Orkis, is, is that, as I said, by the touch of the book itself, but also by its content, this full holistic approach, more and more of the contemporary occultists, magicians go along that path that is not just ritual or just burning incense or whatever, you know, it's not detail. Of course, detail is important, but it's the whole 
artistic experience and of the art and as Crowley put it, the art and the science uh, um, as, as a holistic and one and belonging together thing. Do you feel that in that book as well? Um, I feel it very strongly because um, just a few years ago, I had a pretty um, different approach to magic. And this book is, is some, some kind of was also some kind of a wake-up call for me to do more and to do more work intuitively. So I completely agree with what you just said. Of course, you can. there are also some parts of it which are, which are um, very practical, like the use of incense, for example. There's a whole essay just on incenses. There's a whole essay just on a new translation of the Book of Spirits where um, the Gaetic spirits are put into the proper hierarchy. So it's fantastic for also for people who, who like the more rational approach, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, it, it opened up some different doors because, um, well, as I said, it, for me it was a personal experience because um, sometimes I literally couldn't read on. I experienced some kind of resistance and then I, I did some ritual not anyone of, out of this book, but a personal one. Mm -hmm. And then something happened, I experienced something, I learned something new, I encountered something I didn't expect at all. And suddenly this resistance fell away and the book gave way and the book opened up again. And then reading on a few pages later, five to 10 pages later, I found that experience is validated. So, Actually, this has never happened to me before while reading a book. And um, this happened in the last few weeks, three times for me personally. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been quite a journey for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and thank you for sharing that personal part also with us uh, here today. Thank you. Sounds really like a book that people should get and read. And um, thanks so much for sharing your experience with us but also the general experience on that hope to have you back thank you for being with us today ursula and uh, uh, greetings to salzburg and take care thank you very much it was a pleasure Chapter 4. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome here on the Thoth Hermes Ex Libris episode um, Chris Chudice. Chris, good evening to London from good evening. Here in Vienna. Good evening, Rudolf. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being with us. Well, there is a particular reason, of course, why we meet today, because, uh, Chris, we are going to talk tonight about a very important conference that took place early July this year in Amsterdam. It is the seventh biannual conference of the European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism, also known as ESWE by the, those who know it. And you, Chris, are not only a teacher and eminent academic in the field of Western esotericism, teaching in Gothenburg University, if I'm right. But all the details, our audience will be able to find it in our uh, show notes. Um, but you're also the editor of the Sway newsletter. So we are a bit speaking in that capacity with you today. And yeah, it would be great, Chris, if you could give us a little uh, a report, so to speak, uh, about this year, this year's conference, what were the highlights, what was the primary subject and what happened in Amsterdam early July? Yes, fantastic. Okay. Uh, basically, um, 
The Estway is the most important uh, society dedicated to the study of Western esotericism in, in Europe. You have the ASC in, in the United States, but uh, mm. on this side of the pond, um, Estway conferences are really uh, the most important conferences when it comes to uh, an academic discussion uh, of Western esotericism and all its facets. So um, it's a biannual conference and uh, it's really uh, grown from year to year. Um, this one was the seventh uh, SV conference, and there were, uh, I, th I believe, more than 120 uh, people presenting. Uh, so it, it spanned three days from the second to the fourth, and uh, um, there were obviously uh, concurrent panels um, mm -hmm. over the three days, and there were keynotes, and uh, really uh, there was a bit uh, for uh, a bit for everyone. You know, people interested in uh, in early modern uh, Western esotericism uh, would find something of interest. People interested in uh, more recent developments would as well, mm -hmm. and. Um, the reason why uh, SV7 happened uh, in Amsterdam this year was to uh, celebrate the 20th anniversary of uh, the Center for History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Currents, which is uh, it's probably the, the most important feel, important uh, place in the world where people can do their BAs and MAs and PhDs in the topic of uh, Western esotericism. And uh, mm. it's, it's basically um, a center which is chaired by Wouter Hanegraaff, uh, one of the leading scholars uh, in Western esotericism. So um, it was really, I think, um, it was nice to actually uh, be there and actually celebrate the 20th anniversary of the center as well. Um, sure, yeah. I think that um, one of the one of the most important things to we should say to your listeners was that um, this um, this conference every every conference has its own themes, and this year uh, the theme was visions, voices, and altered states. So uh, really, we were talking about we're talking about really every anything that goes from. Um, visionary encounters with intermediary beings, hearing of inner voices, receiving or channeling of spiritual messages, communication with disembodied entities. Uh, I mean, really, uh, the, 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 the spectrum was uh, really wide and uh, uh, it was approached by, uh, as I was saying, about, uh, about 120 scholars uh, from many, many different um, angles. And of course, uh, as in as in every um, ESRI conference, any, any major conference, um, every day was um, uh, was qualified by uh, a keynote lecture. And uh, I think this year, um, uh, not to speak ill of the previous SW conference, I, I myself was an organizer for the SW4 conference at, uh, in Gothenburg uh, years ago. But this year, the keynote lectures were really, really um, important and interesting because they show um, how Western esotericism as an academic subject is uh, really beginning to become uh, interdisciplinary and is really beginning to kind of uh, interweave itself with uh, more established uh, topics and subjects of study. Um, so it was really uh, the three the three um, keynotes actually showed that in, in a big way. Um, the first one uh, was um, I, I hope to get the order of the of the lectures right, but the first one was by uh, Professor Sonu Shandasani, and he's a professor in London who um, wrote uh, the major um, work on Jung's Red Book. Right, and yeah. uh, so basically, uh, what what uh, Professor Shandasani did was to provide uh, um, a, a basic history uh, of the idea of the concepts of consciousness throughout the ages. So what what did people uh, understand as consciousness, and what did people uh, do with this category called consciousness? So. I think it was a really good way of opening up um, the lecture and kind of providing a, a framework which would kind of consider all uh, to different ages and uh, all the different angles from which later on other scholars would, would chime in uh, more in particular. 
would he would he uh, relate that to the Western thought, or would he see consciousness also in the aspect of the Eastern thought? Well, um, it was more uh, it was more uh, based on the concepts of consciousness in the West. Um, mm -hmm. the, the keynote itself, as you know, it's uh, one of the major um, uh, points of contention. Uh, exactly. To, to, to stay. Um, the second um, the second lecture, which was uh, absolutely amazing, because I really uh, have uh, little knowledge uh, about. Um, the ancient uh, ancient uh, esotericism uh, manifestations of esotericism in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. Uh, I really know little about it, so uh, it was particularly interesting for me because um, Professor uh, Yulia Ustinova from the Ben Gurion University uh, in Israel she um, made did a keynote presentation on ecstatic wisdom in ancient Greece, um, and it's. It was really fascinating because um, she basically went through uh, from the pre-Socratics to uh, to Plato and to Plato's representation of Socrates, and um, went through uh, different instances of um, altered states of consciousness and out-of-body experiences and trance-like meditations, and um, it's uh, I think that's something that. Um, uh, is happening more and more uh, recently uh, that scholars of uh, antiquity are actually uh, linking their knowledge to uh, to a Western esoteric approach and are actually analyzing such uh, such subjects uh, such as ancient philosophy, for example, in this case, through the lens of um, some aspects of uh, of the esoteric discourse, you know, concepts concepts like uh, eudaimonia or blessedness and you know um, things that we do consider to be to kind of be relegated to the study of of uh, ancient Greek and ancient Latin um, were kind of. Uh, revived and made kind of um, really current uh, through this uh, through this keynote lecture, and uh, the third um, oh my god the third the third keynote lecture was absolutely stunning. It's something um, that I've uh, been interested in uh, uh, for ages, and uh, basically Carl Bayer, who's an associate professor at uh, Vienna. He actually yeah. presented a lecture on Albert Hoffman, uh, who's the chemist who invented LSD, and uh, um, his uh, immediate circle of friends. And uh, it's uh, pretty interesting to notice that um, he focused on um, a group of friends of his, which came from um, a traditionalist background and came from uh, the... Um, the cultural milieu of the conservative revolution. So it's the last right. people that you would expect uh, to uh, be involved in, uh, you know, partaking of LSD and hanging out with uh, uh, with Dr. Hoffman. Um, uh, it's it's it was really. I mean, um, I think it's. I think what uh, he presented was um, um, kind of his findings up to now and it's kind of a work in progress which will come out uh, later on in, in in book form but i'm really looking forward to it because uh we're not only talking about uh, traditionalist uh, people, people who uh, would have a kind of Iliade uh, religionist view, um, mm -hmm. you know, and but also uh, people who were deeply influenced by romantic natural philosophy um, and, and sympathized with like the occult arts, you know, magic, alchemy, astrology. And mm -hmm. uh, for me, like the, the, the moment of epiphany was uh, when, uh, when Bayer actually showed the slide of. Um, of uh, um, Hoffman with uh, Ernst Jünger and uh, <laughs> sitting together, you know, and it's like, okay, this is uh, really, really strange bedfellows, you know, all in one picture, you know, it's, uh, yeah. you really would not expect that to happen. So uh, it really was, um, I mean, at least for me, it's something that I had never uh, looked into and I really wasn't expecting to have been actually, to have actually happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think these kind of three 
um, lectures uh, really kind of set the tone for the variety and the kind of inclusiveness of different disciplines, uh, all within, all under the umbrella of uh, of, of Western esotericism. Oh yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds fascinating. Um, I mean, the, the the question of academics and practice, if I may say that very bluntly, right, yeah. ha, ha, has always been something on the move over the last 20, 30 years, yeah, probably much further back than that. But in the last 20, 30 years, I get the impression that the academic world has kind of gotten more back into into the esoteric and occult questions, if I may say it like that. Would you agree on that? And was that also, when you look, for example, into the audience there, would you also sense that practitioners would attend or was it a purely academic audience? Um, I mean, there, there, I think there's an overlap when you, when you uh, talk about uh, the field of Western esotericism. I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not uncommon for um, certain academics to be uh, actually interested uh, in Uh, what they're studying or even other aspects of, of Western esotericism from a practical perspective. I mean, they do exist. I, I, I do know uh, academics who are involved in it in, in a practical way. And uh, when it comes to the audience, of course, I mean, uh, there were there were many people who uh, I think were Uh, I mean, I could only judge, you know, from uh, from uh, appearance and exteriority, yes, exactly. But yes. uh, you know, there was uh, there was a very strong contingent of people who were not uh, involved in actually presenting and delivering papers, who were probably interested in the topic uh, from a practical point of view as well. I mean, I can't know for sure a hundred percent, but mm -hmm. I think that it really needs pointing out so that. Um, The success of uh, Western esotericism as a field, um, which you have said, rightly said, in the past 30 years really has been uh, gaining momentum, uh, mm. really we can start seeing uh, a very uh, mature and um, ethic approach uh, to, the t to the topic from, uh, let's say, Antoine Fevre, And, uh, mm -hmm. and then Walter Hanegraaff onwards. So there is, there is, there is a great division at, in, in, in what is written, in what is researched, um, uh, between what one writes and what one kind of inherently believes or does. You know, mm -hmm. there's, uh, uh, one, one is reminded maybe of the, of the Eranos meetings, you know, when, uh, which were very much, uh, religionist meetings. You know, people would go there right. and they would have a set of beliefs and they would actually, uh, live you know, what they were talking about, you know, I think, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, um, nowadays the field has, has, has really kind of, uh, grown, uh, really independence from, um, from the, the actual practice, uh, aspect right. and, uh, and, you know, there, there's, there's a theoretical, uh, there's a theoretical, um, background and, and structure and there's a methodological framework, um, which have been, Uh, created exactly f for this reason, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, by really amazing scholars that I, uh, that I really appreciate and respect, uh, scholars like Walter Hanegraaff has, has written extensively on, on methodology in the field of Western esotericism. So has Antoine Fevre. I mean, he, he, right. he was the first one to give us really, uh, a working definition of, uh, of Western esotericism in an academic perspective. And, you know, young scholars, younger scholars as well, like, uh, like Egil Asprem, he's written, uh, a lot on, on methodology and on theory. And, uh, so, The answer, the, the, the very long answer, but to conclude, <laughs> to conclude this, uh, to very long yeah, answer. Interesting answer. Um, <laughs> there were, I, I guess, there are, there were a lot of people who are interested who in in, in the kind of practice aspect of uh, of uh, of Western esotericism. But I think the field has really kind of, uh, for a long time already, has kind of grown uh, has grown apart from from that aspect and uh, I think people are very, very clued um, into knowing how to separate the two and um, 
so uh, right. the the presentations themselves uh, were were basically uh, flawless from from an academic point of view. You know, mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't have any any, any emic uh, incursions uh, in uh, in an Esway conference. To yeah, put it, to I put see. it kind of very very bluntly. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, I see. I mean, there were a huge number of breakout sessions then over the three days. I just have the program here in front of me and it's, well, it sounds extremely interesting and I wouldn't have known which room to go first because there were so many interesting things. You yourself, you talked also about Gordiev, I think, at some yes, point. Yes, yes. Um, have you been able to attend some of those other breakout sessions and uh, maybe one or two points that that i know it's difficult but that were special moments for you no Is for sure possible? for sure absolutely um well um i have uh been researching the figure of alistair crowley for the for the past uh 10 years really and i've only mm. uh, recently started um studying gurdjieff in the same kind of depth um and so uh, both me and Professor Carol Kusak from the University of Sydney mm. presented papers on Gurdjieff, and uh, I presented one on on uh, Gurdjieff's uh, dances as a way of right. uh, of alteration of consciousness, as a way of waking up, as Gurdjieff would would put it. Uh, but of course, uh, I still have a very strong interest in scholarship on Alistair Crowley. So um, there were uh, there was more than one panel dedicated to Alistair Crowley, and uh, there was one of them. Uh, in, in which uh, Professor Henrik Bogdan and uh, Manon Hedenberg White and uh, Johan Nilsson and Olivia Sevan spoke, mm-hmm. and uh, it was—I uh, mean, it's really cutting edge, uh, cutting edge uh, research. Uh, I mean, uh, Henrik Bogdan uh, spoke about uh, the alteration of consciousness uh, in Crowley's concept of initiation, uh, because mm-hmm. uh, Henrik's been studying and researching initiation and secrecy. Uh, 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 for uh, almost 15, 20 years now, uh, while uh, Manon was uh, talking about uh, the idea of erotic dis- destruction of the individual consciousness in Crowley's Crossing of the Abyss. So what it means, uh, what crossing the abyss means from a, from a, from a, a consciousness and uh, alteration of consciousness and erotic destruction of the, of the individual. Uh, so kind of the annihilation through, uh, through uh, eroticism in the crossing of the abyss. And I thought that was amazingly fascinating. And, and, and interesting, uh, yeah. of course, yeah, Johan Nielsen instead, he was um, more um, talking about uh, literature and uh, especially literature on um, on opium and the sacralization of intoxicants uh, at mm-hmm. the turn of the century in in occult circles. Uh, so it, it was it, that was something that I, I I really kind of lost it there. I mean, it was uh, one lecture after another of like mind blowing <laughs> things. You know, you get to the end of the day, you know, and you're just like your your head is just filled with that. <laughs> and if I can like quickly quickly point another. Another one, um, just sure. just briefly, it was a panel on on psychedelics and the sixties, of course, and uh, right. their connection, uh, the connection, you know, between between the psychedelic revolution of the sixties and occultism. So, mm-hmm. uh, Leary psychedelic orientalism, uh, uh, or you know, other other subjects related to uh, to that to that age. But uh, yeah. um, you know, I could go on for for ages. But uh, yeah. <laughs> It was it was a, it was yeah. a great success. I mean, it was it was an amazing conference, and uh, uh, I think I think it's just gonna Esway is just gonna grow on and on, and it's gonna become you know it's gonna become bigger yeah. and bigger. Uh, what, what amazed me this time was that uh, in here in Vienna, several people before the uh, before the actual conference um, who are not um, professionals, who are not real researchers or whatever, but. For example, a couple of brother Freemasons who would ask me, have you seen the conference in Amsterdam this year? So it was really also seen by the, so to speak, outside world. Yeah, that was yes. interesting to see. Yeah. Um, do you already know when the next uh, and where the next uh, uh, conference shall be? Wow, it's going to be in two years. Where is at the moment escapes me. Uh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think about it, but no, no, I can't, no, I can't okay. think, I can't okay. think of where well, it will we'll be. Hopefully find out in due course. And 
very last question. Uh, I gather there will be a book. I hope there will be a book made out of those talks and, and roundtables. Do you know anything about that? Will there yeah. be something um, published? Or? Usually, uh, usually there's proceedings of, uh, of the, of the S-Way conferences. Usually they come out right. one or two years after, um, um, after the conference itself. Uh, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's, uh, you can imagine it's, it's a very long process of choosing, you know, 10 or, oh, yeah. you know, 12 uh, presentations sure. that will go in the proceedings. So uh, I think I think it usually it usually takes a couple of years, but there, there, there definitely will be a volume coming yeah. out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, absolutely. And also maybe. for every participant at the uh, at the S-Way uh, conference this year, there was uh, actually a book uh, which summed up the history of uh, of the center in Amsterdam. So, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, so the lucky ones who, who actually got to go to Amsterdam, uh, got a free volume Definitely. with, uh, with yeah. some amazing scholarship celebrates in the 20, 20 years of, uh, of, uh, the Amsterdam center, which I, which I think was really cool. Great. And there is also on the website still of the Amsterdam Hermetica.nl, you can still download the book of abstracts, which makes 96 pages. Yeah. Abstracts, you know? yeah. So if people really want to know what they've missed, uh, they, exactly. can go, yeah, they can go and torture themselves with 96 Absolutely. pages. Absolutely. There you are. There you are. I probably put them online with the, with the notes. Yeah, so you, should. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you for that fascinating talk. It's such a pity we don't, we can't speak for three hours but I it know, gave right? us a real good overview and i hope to have you back on on Thoth hermes sometime soon absolutely thank you for this and thank you for being with me tonight thank you rudolph for inviting me it was a pleasure so this is the end of this month's ex libris episode of the Thoth hermes podcast i must say i really enjoy doing this new format as an alternative to our lengthy interviews as I said already at the end of the first Ex Libris show, it so beautifully allows to point out how diverse our world of the Western tradition is. And it gives me and also you the opportunity to have a glimpse of very different aspects within just a bit over an hour. And also inviting guest hosts and specialists for certain subjects that makes the show more interesting, I think. I hope you like this just as I do. Please do not hesitate to let me know any comments and ideas and also criticism you might have. Our next Ex Libris episode will be coming to you on September 22nd. And before that, do not miss the regular Thoth Hermes episodes, the one with the big interview. Next week, our guests in episode 7 will be alchemist and hermeticist Rubafilas Salfluere from New Zealand, and that will certainly be very interesting. Thanks for listening, and if there are episodes from the past that you have not yet listened to, you can find them all on the website, on Apple Podcast, and on all the major podcast outlets. And now, also all previous and of course all new episodes also on YouTube. Audio only, of course. For now, I can only say, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.